Hi, I'm John Celestri, contributing editor to Globestreet.com, which is powering SIOR Live. We're at the SIOR conference in Las Vegas, and I'm really happy to have with me as my guest, Mark Good, principal at Venture One Real Estate in uh, Chicago, Lincolnshire. I'm yes. sorry. It's okay. Thanks for coming, Mark. Uh, we've heard a lot today about the shifts that are taking place in the industrial market. Before we get into that, talk a little bit about the state of existing industrial, if you would, and the obsolescence factor. Okay. What's happening right now in the industrial market is that buildings that were built 20, 30, 40 years ago are obsolete from a perspective of energy usage. Uh, they're obsolete possibly from the perspective of uh, their, their, their truck docks and their, their, uh, the way their office space is laid out. But what we're seeing is we're seeing investors come in and putting in T5 energy efficient lighting. We're seeing them tear out the office area and put in more efficient windows. Mm -hmm. And so they're bringing up the uh, quality of those buildings from the perspective of energy uh, demands and, uh, and usages. You said 40 years ago. I, I thought it would even have been younger than that. Well, for the last uh, seven or eight years, very few buildings have been built because we've been in a recession. Right. So we don't have that much current stock of new buildings. We don't you know, have new just, stock, right. Right, because they just haven't been building. So that's really just started in the last 24 months. So you really have to go back to the early 2000s to 2007 when a lot of the, what we call now, core product or Class A product was really built. So two questions for you. Um, now that we are out of the recession, what's, what's ahead in terms of build to suit and spec build? That's part one. Part two is, Who's going to be filling those spaces? Okay, uh, let me answer the first question. Um, what we're seeing right now is almost every market in the United States has a disconnect between supply and demand. Right. Because very little product has been built in the last seven years, demand is up and supply is down. When demand is up and supply is down, rents will increase. So the only way to meet the demand that's out there is either to build spec and fill it or do build the suits. So companies are doing both. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the manufacturing companies in the United States that haven't grown in the last you know, 10 or 15 years are now going through a growth spurt and they need extra power, they need compressed airlines, they right. might have a little bit extra office, so they're looking at doing build the suits. And they'll sign 10, 15, 20 year leases because they're investing in the building as well with equipment. Are you seeing an equal amount of activity on the part of manufacturers and retailers? Uh, yes. The, the manufacturing sector in the United States is growing at a, at a very fast pace right now because a lot of U.S. companies, manufacturing companies, are bringing back, onshoring back their manufacturing to the United States. When the large companies do that, the class you know, two and three suppliers to those companies have to gear up for that extra demand. So we're seeing that growth. So that's happening. In the, in the supply chain for them in the 20,000 to 100,000 square foot buildings. Right. And then on the e-retailing, because the demand for that is increasing with all the, with Amazon and all the other e-retailers, they're taking buildings that are between 400,000 square feet to 100 to a million and a half square feet uh, in markets across, major markets across the country. M most of the time they're doing build the suits for that because of their unique space they have, mm -hmm. but a lot of times they'll take a, if it's only four to 600,000 square foot building, they'll take a spec building or an existing building in the market. You and I chatted a couple of weeks ago and you brought up a really interesting point about how with robotics, yes. a company might take as much square footage, won't be taking as many people. Uh, this morning, uh, when uh, Jack Erdick, the uh, futurist, spoke, he said it's not only a function of robotics, but there's also miniaturization going on. There's a whole slew of new technological advances that are actually changing the nature of the supply chain itself. People being able, for example, to grocery shop on their iPhones right. will have major impact for the retail part of it, but also in a negative one, but a major impact and a positive one for distribution 
spaces. What is your reaction to that? Well, I think I think is the change is occurring today going forward. You know, there's been some change for the last few years in that, but it's really starting today going forward that you're seeing these companies really gearing up for this. But one example is Peapod, mm -hmm. uh, which is which is a, a you know a grocery and food right. product distributor. Um, in Chicago, they're taking former bank facilities and having them as drive-throughs next to train stops so that someone can actually order from them during the day. When you get off the train at night and you're driving home, you go through the drive-through and they put your groceries in the back of your car in your trunk. Right. So all of a sudden, uh, a banking facility gets filled with a Peapod delivery system. I think you're going to see the same thing happening with Amazon and others where they'll allow you to order products, but then they'll need a, a pickup station, you know, easily accessible, like a bank drive-through or a, even a restaurant drive-through, where they'll need, you'll just drive in, they'll put it in your trunk and you'll, be, and, you'll, and you'll do it on the way home and it'll save you time from going to the store. So I think that's happening. You had mentioned a study that you did. Can you talk about this, the comparisons that you made with the various downturns and recoveries? That well, right. Well, I, I looked at the last 50 years. Right. And, and when you go back to 1980, we were in a, a recession. And, and, and interest rates were very high. And, and in 1985, we came out of that recession and manufacturing increased and space got occupied by the personal computer business because that grew with Compact and HP and IBM all got in the personal computer business and space got absorbed from manufacturing and suppliers and industries were created. And then in 1990, you know, we had the SNL crisis, the end of the 80s, early 90s. We went into another recession, space became available, and everybody said we'd have 10, 15, 20 years of supply. But in 1995, the internet became powerful and, and came online, and all of a sudden, all that space got absorbed in two or three years. Right. Um, so in the mid-90s, it was the internet absorbing a lot of space and building businesses, and, and that grew. And then in 2000, we had another recession, space became available, people got nervous. But then you looked at it and said e-commerce came on, and, and, and we started importing product from China because of the trade agreement we had with China in the end of the 90s. Well, no one could have predicted those inventions, you know, in 1965, you wouldn't say in, you know, 1985, the personal computer was going to get us out of our real estate crash. 1985, you wouldn't have said that the internet was going to do that in the mid 90s. So I really look at now, you look at the, uh, uh, where we are right now, and I don't think anybody 10 years ago would have predicted that the reason that we're absorbing a lot of space here is because of onshoring, where people are actually bringing right. manufacturing back, back from China and they're manufacturing closer to their consumer base. And I don't think anyone would have predicted in you know, 10 or 15 years ago that all major retailers would have an e-commerce division that was taking up all this space. So, final question for you. You went back to 1985 and found those patterns tied in with the, the economic performance and inter, or technology performance. Technology changes. What's the, what's the prediction then for the next recession? I don't want you to say somebody's going to invent this, but what's the implication in terms of the marriage of the two? Well, I actually think it's a very interesting thing that's going on right now that goes back to demographics. And, 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 and what, what, what I think is happening is that the baby boomers all were in their highest uh, spending patterns from 1985 through 2005, okay? As they grew older, they stopped spending. So we saw a decline, okay? Right. And, and, and that, so we had an uptick, personal computers, internet, all of a sudden, all the baby boomers are in their 60s, they're deciding they don't need more cars, they don't need more sport coats. But what's happening right now is the baby boomers' children are now at the ages of 20 to 40. And they're all starting to spend money and rent apartments right. and buy condos and buy second cars Serious and get married investments. and have children. Right. And so we, all of all of my children are having kids, and I, you know, happily have grandchildren. But but they're spending money and they're getting into their highest earning areas. So now you're seeing an uptick from from the baby boomers' children spending on consumer products, and that's where I think you're going to see the growth. In other words. 
their buying patterns are very different than mine were. Sure. Because they're buying into the technology, they're buying into the iPhones, they're buying into the iPads, and, and all these other things, these apps that are coming out, they're using all of those things, but they're, they're larger consumers than we were. And the reason they're larger consumers than we were is that for the product that they're buying, they're buying it for a small percentage of what that product cost us. Right. Right. Okay, so our phone, my first phone cost me $3,500, my first cell phone. Now it's almost given to you for free if you sign a agreement with the company. So everybody all of a sudden has a cell phone. And, 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 be, and because of that, it becomes disposable. So next year, next year, next year, they'll be buying it. So I see that pattern continuing for a while. Right. Very good. And it's a good way to end. Mark, thank you for your time. My pleasure. And I want to thank you for joining us at SIOR Live.